فاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم أقول أقول أسلم فنقول بدينا نبدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما اغلق وخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي الى صراط المستقيم وعلى اله حق قدره ومثاله العظيم اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علم وتعليم انك على كل شيء قدير Allah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. We talked a little bit about in the previous two sessions about the most important things uh, concerning health. One of them is that the higher worlds exist, or the lower worlds rather exist through the higher worlds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for in Allah yuhibbu al-muttaqeen. And so the most important thing to remember is to be of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. As the health writers are beginning to discover there isn't a magic bullet. If you take exactly this much and exactly that much, then uh, nothing will happen. But rather, there's a great deal that depends on the individual's own uh, point of view. And the best medicine is happiness, and the most enduring happiness is a heart that is filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned the saying of one of the doctors, he said, if you'd want to look at your probability for heart attack, he said, don't look at your cholesterol, look at your cortisol. You know, the stress hormones that are in the, uh, that are, manifest themselves in the saliva and in the cranked up bodies that are, I know. And so the most unhealthy of all people is the man in the box. The man who, or woman, who feels that they're in a predicament, that they can't get out. And so this is of the most detrimental of uh, things. And no amount of health food can get you out of the box. You have to get it, get yourself out of the box. Secondly, we mentioned all of the hadiths, or, not, or a few of the hadiths, of the many hadiths, that indicate that uh, the, uh, when one intends Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by one's uh, eating and one's drinking and one's uh, everything, then one has a reward from Allah. Also, Allah expects a certain level of intelligence, and you can't say, well, I just do what I want, you know, and just eat what I want and smoke what I want and do everything that I want and that's nobody's business. But rather, we, the prophets of Allah, he said, and we taught us, in the legismic alayka haqqan, he says, verily your body has a right over you. Named it a haqq, a right. Or in the aynika alayka haqqan, and verily your eye has a right over you. I sleep, you know, the amount of sleep that you get. I transpose the two last ones. And verily your wife has a right over you, and verily your visitors have a right over you. The Prophet said, So all of these have rights. And so we mentioned the, uh, the, some of the most important uh, things. Uh, the best, we said that the best thing is happiness. And so the books that have come out recent, fairly recently like uh, Healthy at 100 by uh, Robbins, what's his name, Thomas Robbins, John Robbins, and uh, so others pointing out that social connections and happiness in relationships has a huge effect on one's health. And this is statistically, we find that when somebody is uh, forced out of their town and forced to go to another one, frequently help, uh, health hazards or health uh, crises happen after this. Somebody who uh, their spouse dies 
there's a very high pro- probability of a major disease that, that will follow that because of the stress, the uh, stress, and so. Verily, by the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find uh, peace and tranquility and happiness. And so we have to understand happiness is not something that if you buy some of their new product, you'll have all the happiness you can handle. But rather happiness is something that Allah creates in the hearts of those whom he loves. And so it's this end. What did Abu Hassan al that he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his Hizbu Kabir? He said, Nasaluka bedin and hayin and layin and lita'atika. He said, We ask you a, a body that is lithe and easy and energetic for worshipping you. And so this is the ultimate. Uh, actually, we're not talking about any ultimate goods here. We're talking about something, and as far as it's directed to Allah, is giving the body its due, and it's a, it's a good, because Allah has commanded it. Otherwise, we have to ask the same question that Sufis ask about everything. For what? Longevity for what? And this is the point. After So the heart that is tied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has more happiness, and it has... And Allah is likely to give tawfiq to the person. So this is the general thing. We're not talking about something that's way out of base. We're talking on you know, a zawiyah. We mentioned the hadith of the Prophet al-Mu'min al-Qawi khayrun wa habu wa lillahi man min al-Mu'min al-Da'if wa fi kullin khayr. The strong believer is better than closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer, although there is good in both, while well, there is good in both. Well, well, hal here. Man khayr rijal ya Muhammad, the desert tribesman asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, who's the best person? Who's the best man, O Muhammad? He said, man ta'ala amrahu wa hasana amrahu, he whose lifetime is long and his works are good. And so all of these, I know. So... We mentioned the, of the means of Safa is obeying Allah. And this is the, the most important uh, hadith that we mentioned in the Tibb and Nabawi, two of the, of the axial hadiths. One is more specific than the other. It's uh, the Prophet said, the inna halal abayin and inna haram abayin. Verily, the halal is plain and the haram is plain. And between them, there are matters that cause doubts as to which it is, and most, that most people know not what it is. And then the Prophet ﷺ, in the same hadith, he said, Ala fil jasadi mudghay, the salah and salah and jasad al kulluh, or the fasad and fasad and jasad al kulluh. He said, Verily, there is a morsel of flesh in the body that when it is sound, the whole body is sound, and when it is corrupted or spoiled, ruined, the whole body is compromised. Ala wahil qalb, verily, it is the heart. And so the Prophet ﷺ, yeah, he said, they, it's not talking about the calcification of the arteries leading to or from the heart or the plaques, but rather, I believe, because of the first part of the hadith, the siyak, the context, indicating that being right with Allah is the, has a great deal to do with the heart. And so it's the halal plane and the haram plane and one is going on the, the way of the halal. So many people, they have a mistaken idea, and we, this is permissible to the absolute ignoramuses, but for people that can read and are concerned about their health, it's not permissible, it's haram for them. Namely that, well, we can't smoke and we can't drink, so what can we do? Well, we can eat. <laughs> this is the Muslim philosophy, and so you see people with these huge uh, bellies when you go to, it's from every quarter of the compass from the Muslim world. And uh, it's now plain, and this is an area that is just being studied in the last couple of years, that visceral fat, uh, the fat inside the belly that makes a big belly stick out, uh, that's uh, packed in between the intestines and so forth, this is called visceral fat. The fat that's on the outside of the body, on the, under the skin, on the arms and legs, it doesn't have that much effect. But as it, as it turns out, what they found out now is that the visceral fat, the fat that's inside the body cavity there, 
it is a rogue organ. You know, like you have rogue states that use all of their money to occupy other countries to steal their oil and resources, for example. This is a rogue state. Also, you have rogue organs inside the body. And and what does it do? It switches on the wrong genes, and it switches off the wrong genes. And it is responsible for about nine different kinds of cancer. And to date, these are what they found, and and about uh, eight more uh, deadly diseases, uh, including three kinds of dementia, uh, including Alzheimer's and others. This visceral fat, it does all of these things. And so the Prophet Sadaqa Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you don't remember anything else from this uh, these remarks, remember the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ma Mada Adami and Wea and Sharnin Man Batnin. No human being ever filled a vessel worse than a belly. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bi Husbim Ibn Adam, Ukulat and Yaqimna Sadbahu, it is sufficient for a human being to have just a few bites that make that enable him to keep upright and not being hunched over for lack of for hunger. When Kanada Mahalata for in Kanada Mahalata and therefore if uh, it absolutely must be then a third for his food and a third for his drink and a third to catch his breath. And so the Prophet in another hadith the Prophet said he distinguished, he said the food for two is enough for four and the food for four is enough for eight. Distinguishing between one sufficiency and one when stuffing oneself uh, absolutely full and so look at yourself when if you have the uh, if you have a if you're a bit overweight and you decide to lose some weight look what happens to your health while you're losing the weight you find you don't get any colds and you don't get anything as long as that weight's going down the body senses something's happening and it revs up the immune system and what does the body do when you get sick when somebody is sick and they're laying in bed, you say, well, I've just fixed the most delicious pepperoni pizza for you. Come out and eat it. And they'll say, yuck, <laughs> leave me alone. And this is the wisdom of the body. It shuts off the hunger. And more sleep, less food. That's the body's recipe for getting better in a hurry, typically. You know? And so these are uh, a few of the considerations and a few of the hadiths and Uh, that we mentioned before and shall continue to mention. These are the most guiding of all the health things. And so we saw the end. So I I wanted to talk about myopia, short-sightedness, especially in authors uh, and health authors. One book that uh, I found that was interesting and uh, beneficial was uh, Brain Longevity by a... uh, a Jewish convert to Sikhism in America, who has a the anti-Alzheimer's institute or something that he's running somewhere. Intelligent man, and he's done a lot of research and so forth. However, uh, one statement in in the, in the book that uh, is, was absurd and ridiculous and simply wrong. He said, every time somebody fasts, they lose millions of brain cells. And what he didn't understand is that the... the uh, power of the body for homeostasis. That the body, homeostasis means getting on an even keel again after being knocked off an even keel. And so the body can tune itself. It's not a matter of just add the right ingredient at the right time and you'll get this. And that. This is the idea of the nutritionists when they write their books about health. No. Rather, the body makes it up. If you have just a little bit, if you have the, the, basically the right ingredients, the body will adjust. If, you're too, if it's too hot, the body will cool you down. If it's too cold, the body will heat you up. If, it's, uh, if you're not eat, having enough, if you're in a sweaty place and you're not eating enough salt, the body will diminish the, the salt content of your sweat and so forth. This is called homeostasis or keeping the same state. If you could translate it. And so this individual, he didn't understand that there is such a thing as homeostasis and that, in fact, uh, when the body, when one fasts, the body switches in <laughs> to other means. And so the, and otherwise, you know, if we imagine our ancestors, our, my ancestors came from Central Asia uh, 4,000 years ago towards Europe as pastoralists, but that's uh, the age when people were hunter-gatherers in the, in the wilderness. 
you can't really imagine that all the 365 days of, year, of the year they had a, a plate of food at breakfast and another one at lunch and a third one at supper. But rather, there were times when they were very hungry. And there are... Uh, and hunger is not a demon that must be exercised by a, a quick fix, quick energy, some more sweets. But rather, hunger is a valuable thing for one's health. Sumu to sehu, the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fast and you'll be healthy, the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So certainly, and hunger, if one has hungry day after day after day, the body actually goes into a half consumption routine. Somebody was uh, out busy starving some orangutans <laughs> recently, uh, giving them 30%, a group of them 30% uh, less uh, than the ordinary food that is, uh, that is on the orangutan uh, USDA food pyramid. <laughs> And what did they find? They had two uh, orangutans. Uh, I saw a photo of it in a n- nutrition magazine. And had uh, the one that had been starved had a rich, thick coat, and he was uh, big and healthy. And the other one was an old man orangutan, and they were both 34 years old. That was that was you know about a year before the orangutans typically die. And he was kind of little and curled under, and he had been eating his fill or eating his quota. And so hunger, it turns out to be a very hot commodity in health. It's good for one. And so this is one thing that the, the prophetic hadith that we mentioned about the ukulat, it indicates it, 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 nothing bad will happen to you if you're hungry for several hours a day. And many good things will happen to you. One of the good things that happen to, it happens to you is that the memory gets keener. There are hormones secreted in the brain that enable you to fix in the memory the things that are... Uh, that you're looking for, you know, or thinking to, or hoping to uh, remember. You know. So the health factors that we mentioned so far are deen, uh, number one, dhikr, uh, salat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the huge barakah from Allah subhanahu wa taala that is in a heart that is dedicated to Allah. In tansur Allah yan surkum. And if you all aid Allah, Allah will aid you. you know, and so a heart that is dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't have to eat so much. It has, it's an exception from the other rules. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you mid and gives help to it. So all of these things. Food, abstemious. It should be fairly light. Stuffing oneself. You can stuff yourself occasionally. And as we mentioned uh, everybody, when they get between 15 years and 35 years of age, they won't see very many health problems, typically, unless they're really abusive. But when you get a little bit older, you'll start wondering, well, where did that cancer come from, and where did that heart disease come from? And all you can tell is the fun you had. And uh, there are lots of... Uh, so food, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we mentioned the hadith that the Imam al baghawi adduced, that the Prophet ate two kinds of foods at once. He says it shows it's permissible to eat two kinds of foods at once. And everybody was baffled, you know, at the reading of this hadith. What? <laughs> and as it turns out, the uh, array of foods, you know, like uh, the, we had an ordeal that we used to go through called Thanksgiving at our house. And uh, where we watched the, I think the, the, the Super Bowl was on afterwards. Everybody was just so bloated they could hardly see the Super Bowl. And there were, I don't know, as many courses of everything as you could possibly imagine, including the turkey and the uh, pumpkin pie and the cranberries, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So as it turns out, what I'm convinced of now, and we talked about uh, dementia, uh, somebody, uh, a scientist, was talking to me about uh, uh, vascular dementia, and he says, I don't use the term vascular dementia anymore. He's writing a book about Alzheimer's now. He said, because I believe that all dementia is vascular. He says, all of these things, this heart disease and arterial sclerosis and, and uh, atheromas, uh, clots that cause uh, uh, strokes and so forth, and Alzheimer's, he said, they're all various names and the disease is one. 
and uh, his whole uh, belief is that uh, the combination of foods that are integral to the American way of life uh, cause uh, arterial plaques and they cause brain plaques that cause our Alzheimer's disease also. Namely, sugar plus meat in, the same, in one and the same meal. And so it's uh, people talk, asking about what to eat. When, eat these two things separately if you eat them. And uh, sugar is uh, something that cancer, that tumors love and that has, if you, all the books that I recommend in diet, there's nobody that gives sugar a clean bill, bill of health. So that's one thing that one can do for one's health. The, the best thing you can do for your health is to quit smoking. That's the very best thing. The, the most killing thing, one of those cigarettes, it's loaded with uh, radioactive isotopes in addition to tar and nicotine and I don't know how many kinds of poisons. So that cigarette, that's the best thing one can do is to get it out of one's hair and get it, one's, get out, get it out of one's life. And alcohol is close behind and sugar is close behind the two of them. And so all of these things, and uh, well, what's wrong with sugar? Well, when you eat it with meat, it causes advanced glycosylinated, glycosylinated uh, end products, or glycolinated in some of the terminology of the literature. Uh, it's the end products, and what are they? The things that cause big problems in dementia and in uh, circulatory problems. So it's better to have... Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's better to have the meals that are simple. We uh, eat, or my, I eat myself, and I encourage other people to eat whole foods that are relatively uncomplex. And uh, these are the things that I found the baraka and the energy from. So food, drink, and uh, all of these things, when they're intended, and we mentioned the most imp- one of the most important things when you're asking Allah for the baraka asking Allah for the barakah and eating in order to get, have fuel to worship Allah. This is the point. Not uh, eating from lust for gratification of a certain... In Allah, the yarda an al-abd an yaqul al-aklata fayahmidhu alayhim. Verily, Allah loves for the servant to eat some food and to praise him for it. When yashrub al-sharbata fayahmidhu alayhim. And to have a drink and... Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. This is not the point. But there is something that we mentioned that, that can turn every single meal into the most delicious one you've ever eaten, and it is hunger. <laughs> so when a person is genuinely hungry, you don't need to be a, an artful cook or an artful dodger or an artful anything else to make it the best food that you've ever tasted because you're hungry. You know? And uh, so this is one of the most important things. And to intend and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the barakah in one's food, all of these things are important. And uh, sleep, the same thing. You should say the adhkar that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us. You can't say all of them, but pick a couple of them that, uh, that you know, uh, you can continue on and that, are, that, you, that you like. Uh, you know, it's... If you took all of the hadiths about uh, every single hadith of dhikr, firstly, you probably wouldn't get through with them until Fajr came. <laughs> There's many, many hadiths of dhikr. And uh, alhamdulillah, wa shukrulillah. So the ones that are the... And we mentioned exercise. This is the biggest difference. The, uh, well, my entire conviction is that uh, a body that is strong, that is, is very strong, has a power, has a stronger... Uh, homeostatic power than the body that is uh, kind of uh, slack and uh, and is not physically and is not fit. Homeostasis, the ability to manage uh, health challenges and environmental challenges of heat, cold, hunger, thirst, whatever it may be, and stress, and all of these. The body that is strong, al mu'min al qawi, khairun wa hamdu illahi min al mu'min al daif. A strong body has a better power of homeostasis and can fix itself up when there are challenges. And the person that, is, uh, that doesn't do any exercise, and this is, the biggest, this is the biggest difference between the early Muslims. We talk, why were we talk, are we talking about the early Muslims so much? Well, were they any paradigms of health? As a matter of fact, yes, they were. 
the, uh, I would say the average, just my impression, the average age of the people that I made uh, Tarajim biographies of in the Reliance of the Traveler, I, uh, excluding the martyrs, those were, that were killed by violence, by fighting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it was about 85 years old in an age before antisepsis and before germ theory, before vitamins were understood, before, uh, you know, the, before there were hospitals, before, before, before. This was the average age of the early Sufis and the early, and the thing that they had most of was a heart that was filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also, they were sparing in their eating and drinking. They didn't have uh, six kinds of uh, food, or ten kinds, or twelve, or all of these things from here and from there that have this nutrient X and nutrient X. They had dates, and they had water, and they had a bit of bread, and they had an occasional fruits during the course of the year, and vegetables. And, but they were astemias. They didn't have a lot of their food, and they had lots of exercise. And this is typical of every long-lived population on the face of the earth, is that they have lots of physical exertions. And life is simple. They don't have labor-saving devices. <laughs> that have, and labor-saving devices, we mentioned last time, that they've cut out in the period of between uh, 1980 and 1999, the labor-saving devices in the American home had cut out about 80% of the work that existed before then, of scrubbing and rubbing and doing all these things. It's a tremendous amount of efforts. Are, we've been relieved of them. And what does it mean? Bad health, basically. And uh, so there are many conveniences. Somebody without a refrigerator would be going out all the time, and they would have no recourse. And, and Or a washing machine. These are something that are are great conveniences, and we don't despise the nirmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the great difference between us and between the, uh, the, the early Muslims, among the great differences was that they certainly had greater efforts and more exercise. And so my complaint against the books, and I'll, one of the best books that I've read about diet, it talks about the advantages of something that Allah has created. This is the China study. And it's a uh, sort of a radical manifesto against every form of animal food. And uh, so that's not what I'm interested in. But the, what it does show is that vegetables and plant foods of all sorts are filled with many, many, many valuable nutrients. And so this is the lesson that one should use. And it's your diet should be predominantly these f- f- foods. And these, certainly the Muslims didn't put meat on their plate three times a day, the early Muslims and the the Sufis, and some of them, they saw it very seldom, twice a month, would probably be pushing it for the times of the Sahaba and the times of the... As for milk, that was something they had every day for, in many, many places, pastoralists. And so uh, before we talk about the, this, okay, we end uh, Safa, and we talked about pursuing that in which the, where, that doesn't cause much worry. And so what, what relieves a person of uh, stress and of uh, worry and of uh, fretting and of stress hormones and of disease, the diseases caused by it the most, good akhlaq, being dealing with people as one should deal with them and being kind and affable and friendly and having being on good terms with people and or, uh, merely smiling and, uh, and being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So good akhlaq is the way to have good relationships, people like somebody who has good akhlaq. Everything that is listed in the, in the, the, the books of the Sufis about good akhlaq are traits that all people love instinctively. And most of our problems with people are akhlaq problems. We have to admit this, or we're not telling the truth to ourselves. And so this is why we have to put deen at the top of the list of these, of the, of these things. And this is what... Uh, so now we'll, we, a couple of uh, things. Uh, in our world, we have toxins. And there are many things, and so one should uh, well have to get used to the idea that one will be spending a greater percentage of one's income on devices that keep away toxins from off the table, off the out of the drinking water, and out of the uh, out of the food. Uh, they're not as deadly as uh, as eating too much. Eating too much is far, far deadlier than any of these toxins, or lack of exercise, or alcohol, or cigarettes, or these other things. I know these are all far more deadly than these things, especially eating too much. But toxins, when we're talking about poisons and so forth, 
One of the best things that I found in a recent magazine of to eliminate toxins and uh, also pathogens, microbes that causes disease, is that they're advising people now to take off your shoes when you come in off the street because the pathogens, the uh, microbes tend to fall down because, you know, being bound by gravity just like all the rest of us. And so they're on the street and they're on the sidewalk and everywhere. And if you take off your shoes when you come in the door and don't track it in and leave the shoes by the door, you keep your house a lot clearer and a lot cleaner of pathogens. So this is something that was uh, I found personally interesting. Uh, another thing in our times is uh, when you come in from the, from the outside also uh, to wash one's hands uh, with soap when one comes in off the street also because you've been touching everything and uh, there's a lot of surfaces and so forth. And so this is also something that is that when, uh, cleanliness. Uh, toxins, one of the biggest places of, uh, one of the biggest and most lucrative things that they can convince you of is that you're dirty and need to be de- uh, disinfected and deodorized all the time. And so there's a lot of, uh, they power blast uh, all sorts of compounds into our dishwashing soap and into our clothes washing, washing soap and into all, uh, everything with which we clean ourselves and clean shampoo smells like something to eat these days and if it doesn't it won't sell et cetera, et cetera. And so all, most of these flavors and smells have, uh, don't have much to do with health. And you're better getting the plain Jane uh, generic business that doesn't, have a, that doesn't smell like something to eat. Uh, muscone is a cancer-causing uh, vignette of the whole problem. You can read about it. And there's a book called uh, Allergic to the 20th Century that uh, some investigative health reporter wrote recently. It's a reasonable book. Uh, and uh, about people that are allergic to everything. They've just had an overload and they've become allergic to everything. But anyway, the, uh, the things with strong scents uh, and, and strong uh, 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 are often cancer-causing business. When you see, uh, generally I look at labels and I don't know anything about chemistry except what I learned in high school. And my rule of thumb is when it has 16 syllables, don't touch it with a stick. And especially foods, can convenience foods. If you can't pronounce the name of the stuff that's on the package, don't eat it. What won't come out of your mouth, don't put it into your mouth. <laughs> As a general uh, rule. Okay, so toxins, cleanliness, we talked about. Uh, we, uh, homeostasis, homeostasis, we talked about. The body's ability to correct, and it comes from strength. And so we recommend... Uh, exercise. And the Sahaba and others, they had all sorts of exercise, aerobic exercise, and they had strength training exercise, but they didn't do any exercise. They just were living. And so in our times, we, what we recommend, somebody's asking about exercise, I recommend walking. It's the best. It pulls the body together. There should be a time of walking. Uh, they say 40 minutes three times a week, but if you can do something every day, it's, it's better because that's more natural. Uh, so I recommend being in the absolute uh, most taxing. One time I found myself in an airplane and uh, I saw a man next to me and I said, well, what do you do for a living? I was curious. He looked like he was tough. He, was tough. he said, I'm an FBI agent. And I said, oh, is that right? I said, uh, I said what do you do in the FBI? And he says, I'm into fugitive apprehension. In other words, he's one of the people that breaks down the doors at 3 o'clock in the morning and nabs the fugitives and takes them to justice or otherwise. And so I said, said, can you mind if I ask you a couple questions? And so I asked him about his exercise routine. So he said, I do push-ups. And I said, how many do you do? And he said, to to failure. And I said, said, and and, and chin-ups, he said the same thing. He said, I do them to failure. And all of his exercises he did to failure. And this is one of, as it turns out, it turns out to be one of the most very valuable things of exercising is to do the exercise to the point where you can't do anything more, where you're just, that's it. And that state has an enormous uh, uh, strengthening uh, fact. Well, how am I supposed to know? All you have to do is very simple. If you want to do some chin ups or push ups, for example, start with one this week and add one each week. And before too many weeks are passed, you'll be up to failure, <laughs> so as to speak. So this is when this, this zone or whatever they call, call it, where it's at the absolute utmost you can expand and you feel like your heart's about ready to pop out of your body. This is one of the most beneficial. There should be some of this exercise in your life. 
Okay, in addition to walking, which is aerobic exercise, there should be this uh, real hard, challenging, phys- and it should happen twice a day, I, I believe, in order for the person to be physically fit. Talking about people that will make a difference and not just, you know, you know make it, schlep it through life and somehow get to the other end, but people that will do something for Islam and who will, inshallah ta'ala, be a reason for the solution and not for the problem. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, also weight training. This is also something that a person should, should do. And uh, weight bearing exercise, push ups is something, and chin ups are something. But uh, weights are something that I uh, certainly believe in. And then uh, these are some, and calisthenics, something that is challenging on the wind. Walking isn't that challenging, but something that really challenges the wind. Uh, and we put up a little calisthenic thing. So all of these, uh, the Sahaba, the Oman, well, how much exercise should I do? What I think is uh, immoderate exercise four times a day is plenty. <laughs> and uh, this is what I recommend. And uh, not, a, a, you know, one time a week, you know, you're going, I'm going to exercise, get on your jogging suit and go out and have a heart attack. But rather have it, you know, make your exercise frequently during the day, just a couple of exercises that are that get you up to a point where where it's hard, and uh, needless to say, walking to the masjid is something that should, must should be done and must be done. Uh, hunger and fasting we talked about, uh, and uh, we uh, let's see, food, drink, sleep, and exercise. Yeah, for uh, the, the visceral fat, the killer fat that we talked about, we have. Uh, what they recommend uh, is that a uh, lady's waist should not be more than 88 centimeters. Waist, we mean the waist, which is between the, uh, the lower rib cage and between the uh, uh, upper hip. Uh, and uh, it's right under the navel. And uh, for men, it, uh, the, the waistline, when one is relaxed, should not exceed... Uh, about 100 centimeters, and so that's what that's what we mean. Uh, cholesterol. One should uh, test one's cholesterol occasionally. It's not that important when you're young, but uh, it shows you how good your health habits. When, we, when you get in the exercise level that we're talking about, what is healthy, your uh, the your HDL cholesterol, the good good cholesterol, or total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol ratio should be between two and between three. And this should tell you if you're, so it would be two point something, for example. It means that your diet and your exercise is working. And if it's uh, higher than that, if it's like uh, 3.5, 4, so forth, this is, you can win, win some points from the physicians of our times, but it's not really fitness, I don't think. So these are some of the things. And of the books that we mentioned, uh, inshallah ta'ala, as you can, the uh, Ultimate Omega-3 Diet, that's a, a reasonable book. Uh, that We mentioned the Mayo Clinic uh, Family Health Book, as a, uh, which depicts uh, the health advice in our time, or, or the uh, allopathic medicine in our time. The book by Robbins, we mentioned Healthy at 100. Uh, another book, uh, the Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine, uh, the books, uh, some of the books of Andrew Whale, I, the, the ones that I've read, I found most of them were good. Eight Weeks to Optimal Health is a good book. Spontaneous Healing by uh, uh, Andrew Whale also is a good book. Natural Health, Natural Healing, uh, uh, Natural Medicine, excuse me, is a good book. Healthy Aging is a good book. Uh, by Kirschman, Kirschman, uh, the uh, Nutritional Almanac, the Nutritional Almanac. And the China study, this is a good balance. And uh, Pitchford's Healing with Whole Foods is good. Uh, the Complete Idiot's Guide to Vitamins and Minerals is a uh, reasonable book. Nourishing Traditions, the introduction to it is good. It's about 60 pages. It's a good antidote for the China study. And uh, of periodicals, and these are really quite good. Uh, uh, Nutrition Action Newsletter, it's published in the United States. And consumer reports on health. These neither of them have any advertising, and they're, they're, most of the articles are, especially Nutrition Action, has a lot about the junk food uh, of uh, on the American grocery sales, so that need not concern us here. 
However, the leading article is always good. It's invariably something that's uh, fairly good. So these are some of the things that... Uh, as for the... Uh, yeah, alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. Yeah, we mentioned most of the things that... Uh, so, inshallah, I didn't get to talk about this book in depth, but inshallah, with the Monterey did talk. He talks, to, he says, basically, all dairy products, he's, uh, you know, they're phobic of them, and, uh, and this is mistaken and wrong. You also have to look at your genes, and you have to look at the kind of foods that your ancestors ate. And so, uh, milk and uh, yogurt and so forth may be very... Uh, it's, it's unsuitable for some uh, people, for most people, because most people's ancestors were not herdsmen. But for those who had ancestors who were herdsmen and ate it all the time, someone says, oh, I read you know, about my blood type, and it says I'm not supposed to eat any wheat. I said, are you crazy? I said, you're from the Punjab. And I said, not eat any wheat? They've been producing all of Asia's wheat for 4,000 years. What are you talking about? <laughs> So you have to look. You have to, you know, you have to see what the ancestors ate and so forth. And so the genes do have. A, and this is the problem with the China study. Uh, it's a, it's a, it has a good book and it's a sincere book. It has too many exclamation marks to be entirely scientific. But uh, it uh, it doesn't pay enough attention to culture and to the, i.e. the ones that can afford to eat meat that he's saying have the highest cancer ratios. They also have a host of other social economic factors in their lives. And uh, also, it's also abstract. Uh, one of our, uh, Dr. Mansour Muhammad, who you know, a world-class geneticist, was talking about the lack of the genetic appreciation in the nutritionist-only point of view that this book is written from. So if you went and you went to an island somewhere in Polynesia, and you see, said, well, now I have the new Polynesian diet. I'll publish my book and become rich. He says, well, not everybody, not all the readers have Polynesian genes. He said... And so it, 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 there's a lot of factors there, but uh, we tried to emphasize the ones. So the main thing is that we should use everything that we possess to draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when this intention exists, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives medid and gives barakah and everything. And so to obey Allah and obey the Messenger and intend nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, with taqullah, we are limukum Allah. And fear Allah, and Allah is teaching you. نسأل الله التوفيق والتيسير والحمد لله رب العالمين. Okay, I have to take care of a few details. So I think I've answered most of the questions here. Uh, let's see, should we be pooling our resources to help develop uh, projects like organic farming? No, don't go near a farm. I grew up with farmers, and it's a very, very hard life. <laughs> if you want a lot of hard work, become a farmer. It would be better to just buy what the farmers raise, and uh, it's much easier. So much exercise we talked about. Optimal times for it when you're not when you when you're not full, basically. Uh, what is the proper ad- ad- adab of a dinner guest being served unhealthy foods and sweets that one doesn't typically eat? Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said to them, "Get a healthy appetite, so you love simple and healthy uh, foods that conduce to health, and that you shun and, and don't like uh, unhealthy foods. You get those kind of habits." And the Prophet said to him, uh, The Prophet said to him, if he wanted, to, if he was eager to eat something, he ate it. And if he didn't really care for it, he didn't eat it. He left it. And so we don't, there's no, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, no, but rather, if you like it, eat it. And if you don't like it, don't eat it. This is the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah wa shukri la Allahu akbar Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Hayya ala salati, hayya ala salat, hayya ala falah, hayya ala falah. Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahumma rabbi hadhihi da'wati tamat wa salatu qa'imat yaati sayyidina Muhammadan wa siratan wa fadila. Wa ba'thu maqam wa ma'kuna dhali wa antahum. Allahumma inna nasalaka al-afiyah fi dunya wa al-akhirah. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he taught us to ask for after the adhan and saying the salat on the Prophet. He said, you'll be answered in your dua at that time. So what do we ask? He said, ask for well-being and good health in this world and well-being in the next world. He says after that. And, so, uh, if you, and if Allah makes you sick, he's trying to teach you something. And so find out what it is. I said, Allah, tawfiq, what I say. 
Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So always ask Allah for good health. Wabilahi. Fatiha. Fatiha. Okay, inshallah ta'ala wa ta'ala. Take a few questions here. Yeah, we wanted to mention Allah. Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. So what do we say everything that we've said uh, in brief, as briefly as possible. Uh, studies, uh, this is the year, this and last year are the years where there's a vogue for uh, one-word book titles. <laughs> and one of the recent one-word book titles, I think it's being published this month, is Wrong. <laughs> and it's about medical studies. And uh, the author points out that uh, of the 45 uh, top medical stories in the top um, medical journals, research stories of the past decade, the most important ones, the fully one-third of them have been un, uh, un, not possible to verify. Nobody could duplicate the research. And so the newest discovery, <laughs> we have to take it with a grain of salt and we have to use our common sense. That's one thing. Secondly, one of the most, uh, you know, the double-blind and the uh, uh, placebo effect and so forth, what we've tried to point out here is that man has a context in the divine. And no matter if somebody balances all of the ingredients correctly, if Allah wants him to be sick, a person will be sick. And if a person has a higher purpose, he can eat very little and very little of the, even the right things, and Allah keep him well. And so this, this is a, one of the points. Another uh, point is something that someone said to me about 13 years ago. He said, in the future, in Cambridge, somebody said this to me. He said, uh, in the future, he said, doctors will be of those of two kinds. And he said, those who know something about genetics. And he says, and the ignorance, or the ignoramuses. And so this is also a second thing that the studies have to be abstra- are abs- abstracted from <laughs> is the genetics of the subjects of the study. In statistics, everybody just counts for one, <laughs> and it doesn't talk much about the quality and the, what, what's inside. And as it turns out, people look about as differently inside as they do outside. You know? And so this is another fact that the researcher cannot really take into consideration. Very. So that this is the reason that uh, we mentioned to, to look at one's, what one's ancestors ate. I was reading about a mountain, uh, a dinner prepared for guests in a mountain uh, uh, sort of uh, village or it's a farmhouse by a traveler there. And where is my ancestors, I think, may have come from uh, Switzerland, the Germans. And uh, so what was on the menu for this? Uh, we have the China report that meat and milk products are deadly poison, basically, and cause cancer and cause uh, everything from soup to nuts. So what was on the, on the menu was uh, for this traveler that stopped in a farmhouse in the mountains in England or in Switzerland. So he had uh, oat, uh, oat, uh, oat bread and curds, i.e. cottage cheese, and uh, cheese and cream and butter. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and so they would have all become extinct a long time ago if the 
matter, which as this author suggests. However, this is uh, we have we named a number of books at the end of the last session that a person might. Have. Many of them are simply references. You know, the reference is something you leave on the shelf until you need to figure out what's what's wrong and, and how to fix it. And uh, we should have a shorter list, but this would be on the shorter list also because it reminds one of the many blessings. It's called the China Study. And it's, uh, it reminds one of the many blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in vegetal foods. And that the protein in, veg- in vegetal foods is as good or better as than the protein in meat foods, in animal foods. And this is certainly true. However, the animals, some of the animals, like uh, fish, for example, they combine, they condense within them some, a very high measure of minerals and vitamins and a lot of substances that are not found without a great deal of difficulty in the vegetable kingdom, I know. So this is one of the, uh, yeah, the uh, books that we would recommend on the short list is this book, The China Study. And we'd also recommend on the short list The Complete Idiot's Guide to Vitamins and Minerals. And also on the short list, we would uh, recommend the introduction, the 70 or so page introduction, and the chapter beginnings also of uh, Sally Fallon's uh, Nourishing Traditions, in which she talks about the uh, genetic uh, makeup of things. And we'll return to that after we, uh, we say. So this is a very valuable book. There's a great deal of merit and insight and work in this book, in the book, The China Study. Let's see, if another one. Oh, yeah, another, uh, and two more short, uh, the short titles. Uh, Healthy at 100 by Robbins, and uh, one of uh, Andrew Wales' books, uh, W-E-I-L, uh, such as Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, Spontaneous Healing, or uh, uh, Healthy Aging, or it's a, one of these books, I know. And so these are the short list, and possibly the ultimate omega-3 diet. It has good science in it, not uh, just that. Uh, and so there's a great deal of merit and insight and work in this book, The China Study. But when, like all scientific works, and like you read in the book wrong, <laughs> uh, and the studies have to be taken with a grain of salt and with contextualizing. Someone with a purpose in life uh, is not like someone whose the, the rug has been pulled out from under them and they find themselves in an impossible predicament to escape. Such a person will be unhealthy, will be sick, almost despite anything, anything that they eat. And so this is, uh, this is something that's very important. There's an emotional context and a social context within, with every individual. There's a higher religious context that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yumid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps whomever he wills, whoever dedicates himself to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things easy for him you know, or her. And so all of those, in addition to being abstracted or being taken out of context from genetics, the Chinese, with their many great cultural uh, achievements, are not famous for uh, being able to digest dairy products, but quite the contrary. Like most of the, like the other 70% of the world that finds dairy products not very digestible, <laughs> they too uh, find them un- very undigestible. And so the conclusions, well, how did this book, what the China study is not the only thing in this book. The author has used as a title the most prestigious and the most well-tested thing that's in the book, but it's by no means the whole book at all. It's the, the, the author's own experience with vegetarian fare and backed by the China study, which is the centerpiece of his. Uh, Zhou Enlai, whom some of you may not remember, the heir apparent and heir in fact, of uh, Mao Zedong, the uh, ruler of China, uh, lay dying of cancer in Peking, and uh, now it's Beijing. And uh, as he lay dying of cancer, he ordered a massive study of everyone in China and the rates of cancer everywhere. And it, it had millions of subjects in it. And so it was a snapshot of life in China at that time. And what they found is that basically the people that ate mostly vegetal foods, mostly plant foods, 
uh, had far less cancer, far less heart disease, far, far less dementia, far less diseases of all sorts. And this is what, we've, uh, is, uh, what we can believe when we try to emphasize uh, the uh, exercise of our ancestors earlier. Uh, somebody who exercises for a couple hours after exercising hard, especially, there's uh, a lot of neutrophils and there's a lot of killer T cells and there's a lot of the body's natural immune defense, uh, defenses are roused up and the whole squad of cops is on the beat <laughs> looking for some disease to kill. And this is what happens when everyone... Uh, and so people that are, expend a great deal of physical force several times a day, there's simply more cops on the beat to defeat any diseases that come along. And so, the, unsurprisingly, the people that ate all these uh, vegetal foods were farmers. Why? Because they couldn't afford the pork and beef and everything that the city paid people could. And still, and to this day, the farmers in China are angry that they're so poor and can't afford the things that the workers in the city can afford. This a grassroots rebellion of the rural workers in China. And so this is something that the study uh, doesn't pay suf- sufficient attention to. So, uh, first of all, exercise, little, uh, exercise levels differ considerably between the class strata capable of affording high animal protein diets, fats, etc., and those who cannot. So the exercise levels differ. There's a great deal of difference between them. They, the, first, the former have to work harder. And uh, are, are, I know, are the, those that cannot afford have to work harder, as do stress levels. Uh, Joe White Collar Worker has got a higher stress level, and stress has everything to do with disease. And so the author is a nutritionist, and so he views everything through the glass of, a, of nutrition. And a person is not just what they eat, but they have a larger context, as we've said. Okay, foods and enzymes, vitamins, sugars, refinement, fermentation, combination, and many other variables vary with and cluster around so- social, cultural, and class distinctions. You know, what kinds of foods are in with the upper classes, you know, they you know, are, could be very bad for one, and frequently are. And the plain Jane food that the rank and file eat out in the fields have maybe a lot healthier, and frequently are, in my opinion, as do toxins. Toxins vary also with class uh, uh, and class distinctions. And, and, uh, and another point, genetic factors and their environmental triggers. It's not just the genes you have, it's whether there are environmental triggers that, sh- that shoot off these genes. And there are a lot of them. This is one of the, dis- uh, the, uh, uh, the discoveries of the last three years. Uh, and that there are triggers that, uh, that, that the cannon is loaded for diabetes in certain races or for Alzheimer's or for uh, varicose veins and environmental factors kick it off and pull, pull the trigger. And so there's these also the triggers and the genes, genetic, genetic factors themselves vary with the different peoples. Oh, the, the study that Zhou and Lai conducted or that ordered to be done was all among the Han Chinese, the great body of Chinese. So the genetic factors were out. But they are not... Uh, Dr. Mansur Muhammad, when he read this book at my request, he said uh, it's, the, it's a logical fallacy when you take Logic 101 in college, if you ever get to such a class, uh, you'll find that uh, it's unwarranted generalization is one of the logical fallacies. You go into drive through a town of 20,000 people and you see one drunk laying in the street and you see a second drunk laying in the street and you say, this town is nothing but a bunch of drunks. And th- this is a logical fallacy. You have to have, you know, tell exactly how much. And so uh, the study of one population and a gen- genetically homogenous population such as the Han Chinese, even if huge, does not always re, uh, uh, produce uh, generalizable data to other races and to others. Um, another point is that the Prophet, alayhim, uh, be blessings and peace upon him, be blessings and peace, ate meat and they drank uh, milk and they herded sheep, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them to guide mankind. And so if this was all, you know, deadly poison, uh, one of the studies that he cites, for example, is feeding casein. Casein 
is a protein that is found in milk products that constitutes about 87% of the protein in milk, is casein. If you wonder what it looks like, take a look at a bottle of Elmer's glue, the white, that's casein, casein cement, they call it. And uh, they fed rats uh, as casein, and uh, the susceptibility to toxins, aflatoxins, ca- uh, cancer-causing toxins, was immensely uh, enhanced by the presence of casein. But the question arises, well, what are rats doing eating eight times their weight in casein anyway? It's not a usual <laughs> rat food. And so, the, again, it's abstraction. The, the scientist had likes to look at with the statistician and the nutritionist also looks at them to, at, from, to, his, to some degree. From a, and pastoralists, uh, pastoralist populations, uh, hunter and fisherman uh, traditional peoples did not perish of cancers and degenerative, de- uh, degenerative conditions. So these are all some of the things that came to my mind so far as I... I have read through this. Uh, okay, so we've had... Uh, uh, let's see. So the first question we have, what if you don't know who your ancestors are? Well, guess. <laughs> and uh, secondly, you know, if other things being equal, you can presume that your ancestors were peasants and farmers <laughs> because most of our ancestors were. And so what, what did they tend to eat? They ate grain and they ate milk products and they ate... Uh, their vegetables that they had, and they had a lot more efforts than we did. Uh, someone asked me last night, "Well, what about the, what, what about what they say about uh, everybody should drink three liters of mil- of water daily?" Uh, this was an urban myth that uh, came. The, the United States Department of Agriculture estimated the daily water intake from all sources for the ordinary American person as six glasses of water. And so everyone, all of the, it shows you that the people writing nutrition books are like sheep following each other around because they all took up this as their battle cry. And one member of my family, a junior member, was trying to force six glasses of water down everybody in the family's throat. And so this all turns out to be an urban myth. And uh, you, should have to, you have to look. And it, again, it's abstracted. What's the climate like? And so one should drink water when one is thirsty. <laughs> And when it was, and don't try to force the. Indeed, the Chinese uh, medicine is that um, six. Don't drink more than six glasses of water under any circumstances, or you'll weaken your kidneys. They say. I think they mean the bladder by which. But at any rate, anybody who's lived in Jordan, uh, myself, for example, uh, I drink a, a liter and a half uh, bottle of water. Uh, in about, it takes about two weeks to get through one during the winter, and I might drink two of them a day during the summer. So, you know, it's just common sense <laughs> that you know, six glasses a day, rain or shine, winter or summer. What do you, you know? So this was a fallacy, and this was an urban myth, and there isn't a, there isn't a quota that you have to gulp down, or you'll be in dire straits. In general, when the urine is dark and thick. Uh, then you better start drinking some water because you're dehydrated. And so this is the uh, bottom line. Uh, vitamins, uh, another question. We, there are, it's more like none a day than one a day for vitamins. You should get your vitamins from a uh, food. Most of your food should be vegetables. It should be you know, plant foods. Uh, something like about nine servings a day is reasonable. A serving is what fits into the palm of one hand, roughly. And so about this much of the vegetable foods. Uh, wheat and whole wheat products, and uh, these things have a lot of protein in them. Grains have protein, beans have protein in them. So you can get your protein from these uh, foods. And the China study, if you read it, it's, uh, it's, we've said, not saying the book doesn't have any merit, has a great deal of merit, and it shows that the vegetable foods are indeed rich with a, a lot of things that we need. Uh, if one takes a, a practical guide, uh, some sort of omega-3 uh, uh, fish oil t- uh, capsules, vegetal capsules, is a reasonable precaution. Or the uh, or these uh, uh, cod liver oil, uh, that the lemon-flavored cod liver oil. Uh, I sent it to one of my uh, old friends in Sham, and uh, he said he had joint problems. I said I'll send you just what you need, and so. 
he thought that the color of the royal was uh, liniment. And so he, I said, how did it work out? And he said, boy, he says, this stuff stinks. <laughs> and so he apparently rubbed it on his knees. And then the lemon flavor wore off after a couple hours. <laughs> and it just smelled like st- stinking fish. And so, but uh, otherwise, uh, if you take it uh, before meals, uh, it's, it's something that, that's worthwhile to take. That, that supplement, vitamin B12 is a reasonable supplement to take. Uh, and, so, and vitamin D. There's an v- epidemic of cancer that in America that people believe may be well, may, uh, well, may be uh, believed to. Uh, there's a lot more cancer in the north where there's less sun compared to the southern United States where there's more sun. And so they believe that in and, and, uh, Britain, especially among the South Asian Muslim community, there is uh, all sorts of problems, and when the when the vitamin D gets low, it's not in only the, this cancer and others, uh, and it, it has something to do with almost every metabolic process, as it turns out. Uh, anyway, get it tested, and if it's less than 70, think about ways to uh, 70 like, milligrams per uh, liter or something like that. I forget how it goes, but if it's less than the reading is less than 70. Uh, then uh, figure out ways to get it up there, the vitamin D. And it's easy. You can take, if one is radically deficient in vitamin D, take a a 10,000 international unit capsule. Sounds like a huge amount. It's just 10,000 international unit means two or three milligrams, as it turns out. But uh, for 10 days, and after that, take one of this, or no, it's 50,000, actually, 50,000 international unit uh, capsules for uh, one each day for 10 days, and after that, one every two weeks, and that's enough vitamin D. But there is an epidemic. And in Britain, it causes problems from panic attacks to psychosis uh, among the Muslim uh, families there. And so it's worth looking into people. And uh, it has a great deal to do with a lot of things. And so vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin uh, uh, and uh, omega-3 oils and vitamin B12, most of the other vitamins should be obtainable from your food. Uh, vitamin, there's been a vitamin revolution in the past uh, two years, as I mentioned. Vitamin E and vitamin C, even at moderate levels, were billed as antioxidants. And as it turns out, they diminish the body's ability to handle its own oxidative stress. Every time you exercise, you have oxidation. Oxidation, what does it do? It rusts the system out. And, but the body neutralizes the, ox- the, the, the free radicals the, uh, that cause the oxidation. The body neutralizes them it- itself. Unless one is taking vitamin C pills and vitamin uh, E pills, in which case the body says, well, we don't have to do anything, and it doesn't reduce its own oxidative stress. And this has proved problematic. And this is what studies have uh, shown within the last two years. And so people are no longer popping barrels full of vitamin C and barrels full of vitamin E. And so these are the three things, the omega-3 supplement, vitamin D supplement, and uh, vitamin B12 supplement seem like a reasonable precaution for most people to look into for supplementation. If you do take supplements or you have some special problem that you take supplements for or to prevent, uh, you should have w- one day out of every seven days, i.e. once a week, skip your supplement. Skip the supplement and so that it uh, remains vital and strong as it still has an effect, in other words. And we mentioned grains. Uh, we mentioned fats also. Uh, fats are not uh, as frightening as then they say bad fat when they mean saturated fat. Saturated fat does not cause a direct increase in blood fats. I, I, my, personally, I eat double the saturated fats that are uh, that one should every day, and my uh, my triglycerides, the blood fats, and cholesterol level is remarkably low. It's very low, and so they don't have it. But you have to be hungry. As for when someone is stuffed all the time and shoveling on yet more and more fats, they don't have a salutary effect. Uh, and one thing we tried to emphasize is that weight is of the utmost importance, how much one weighs. And uh, we talked about the visceral fat, the thing that gives a person a belly, and uh, 
we said a belly consists in uh, a waistline of more than 101 or 100, approximately 100 centimeters for men and about 88 centimeters for women. And if your waistline is more than this, then you should get it down. And what I recommend, the easiest way to do is to uh, get somebody to look up for you on the Internet or look it up yourself. The Metropolitan Life Insurance Company uh, statistics for, our, uh, for 1959, the table for 1959 that they came up with. This is the best thing. And you'll find that if you have osteoarthritis, if you have all of these the things that are that bug people when they get up to my age at least, the things will disappear and the me- medical problems will disappear if you get your weight down to the level that they recommend. And this is my conviction that this is the, one of the most... Optimal weight is highly associated with optimal health. And all of the hadiths, how many do we have? We've mentioned them more than once in this presentation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the, you know, the Sahaba were not rotund individuals. They were slim. They were lean and mean. You know. And uh, just as a short list for what they've discovered, that visceral fat, if you do have a gut, well, so what? Well, that it's been directly linked to, the, so far, the, the research that it's pro- proven to have a direct link with are diseases including diabetes, heart disease, sleep apnea, dementia, Alzheimer's, gallbladder stones, gastrointestinal disease, terminal liver cirrhosis, ovarian cystic disease, which is absolutely rife in our times with the women, breast cancer, colon cancer, esophagus cancer, kidney cancer, uterus cancer, gallbladder cancer, liver cancer, pancreas cancer, prostate cancer, and insulin resistance. So all of these. So if that list isn't long enough, then it means that you also don't have a single active brain cell. So that's another medical problem. (laughs) Okay, so that being said, question... Uh, what should we do about meeting, uh, buying meat here? All of the meat that's slaughtered here is the biha, if you're talking about the halal and haram. And if you're talking about that which uh, gives the best health, eat meat about three times a month and buy fish the rest of the time or use something else. That's my advice. Um, red meat. In other words, uh, meat that's red. And so uh, chicken, yeah, I quit eating chicken. I used to put away lots of chicken. and I used to cut chicken one time when I was going to school. I uh, Phil's fish, fish and Poultry in Los Angeles. And uh, so I came here and I was cutting my chicken. I used to buy them whole and cut them myself. And lo and behold, I would see big, round, hard, white patches in the liver. It started appearing. What was it? Cancer. And I saw uh, hearts that looked like your little finger. Instead of a heart-shaped heart, it a heart that looked like a little finger. Well, where on earth did that come from? It came from hormones that made the animal grow three times as fast as it's supposed to. And so I kind of checked out of the chicken market after that uh, as a consumer here because this is the way. And, and there even was chicken meat isn't white. Chicken meat is red. If you take a look at look at your runaround chickens, you know, the, the breast meat, but chickens, are the, when the, the, the bones are hard to cut through, all this, the, the chickens that just sit around are anemic. The problem is they don't, they don't have enough iron in their tissues, and they're anemic animals. That's why they're white. Same thing with turkeys. Same thing with pork, for that matter, although we don't eat it. Is uh, All these animals are anemic. They're raised poorly, and the animals are miserable until they're slaughtered, and then the people that eat them I take on the burden. But, uh, so it's, the regular meat is fine. The chicken are, are fine as far as being Islamically slaughtered. If you want to have my advice, get run-around chickens it's from somewhere. Find out where you can find them. They're not so common. Better than that is to get run-around chicken eggs, which is a replenishable, replenishable uh, thing. So what do they call it? Free range, I think they call it. But they still don't look like the runaround chickens here. The free-range stuff that you buy in the West still looks is a bit more anemic. Than, they just have a little bit wider. And so, uh, what do I do about buying meat? I don't eat it except on the eeds. <laughs> I know. That's a lot of topic what they say. 
and that we answered the water question. Uh, yeah, can you please clarify the, the issue on eating meats alongside sugars? Does uh, sugar include starches like rice and potatoes? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Nor are the sugars in anything else. We're talking about refined sugars. And so refined sugars are, are basically they're bad news. I had a couple of things that I wanted to mention that are basically bad news that don't, well, that, you know, we talked about genetics and what your ancestors were eating. These are some of the things that your ancestors were not eating. Polysyllabic additives and emulsifiers. And then things with huge 16-syllable long names. You can bet that your ancestors didn't put away a lot of it. And if you put away a lot of it, you're going to see something really new, typically. Uh, sugar was something that people didn't pile on like they do now. Get over your sweet tooth. Myself, I like to have some sweets. And what I do is I do what the Prophet them and what the Sahaba used to do. When I, I have dates as my main entree for two meals a week, and that's it. And so I can get as I have as much sweets. I have about, I don't know, 15 dates or so, 17 something dates. And that's plenty sweet. They have more sugar in them than honey does per weight. Dates do. And uh, in Ramadan, that's an exception because you need a bit more high-calorie food because, you know, you can't make it through the day. Uh, a little tip for fasting Ramadan that I learned is that if you exercise hard, you know, you go out and knock out 20, 30, 40, 100 push-ups after Salat al-Asr, you'll suddenly be picked up again and you feel like you've just eaten. Why? Because the body stores fuel in the muscles. Glycogen is stored in the muscle tissues. And if you have a mild workout, uh, when you're really beat, I go up to Asr typically pretty beat uh, at, the, at the end of a fast day of Ramadan. But if you exercise a little bit after that, you'll find that you'll pick yourself up for the last hour or so of, the, of uh, Ramadan. You'll feel stronger with one glass of water and going up the hill for Salat al-Maghrib than you did for Asr. And so the, a little bit of exercise will pick you up because it draws the energy out of the muscles, uh, the glycogen. Okay, here's a list, short list of things that uh, your ancestors did not eat and uh, I feel are not valuable food items. Sugar. Sugar has, does not have a clean bill of health with uh, all of the people that know. And uh, it's what it does. It's not what it does when you give rats their t- twice their weight in sugar, but it's what it does in conjunction with other foods. And it beats out other useful foods, and it combines with enzymes in surprising ways in the body. White flour. And in general, a lot of refined stuff. Refined means ground until it's really, really fine. Uh, what does this do when you grind something fine? If you take a ball and you break it in half, what happens? You've increased the surface area of it or maybe almost a double, right? Consider the question a second. You have a ball. How much surface area you got? Well, here it is, one unit. Split it in half, and then it falls open, and you've got two more surfaces there right in front of your eyes. You've expanded its surface area. If you break it into eight pieces you've got a lot more surface area. And if you break it into fine, fine powder, you've increased the surface area of the ball a thousand times or thousands of times. So the metabolic processes, the acids in your stomach and the other things, and the, uh, the swiftness with which, which, which those is based on the amount of available surface. And so this is why refined sugar and refined anything goes into the, surf, it goes into the bloodstream much more rapidly than whole foods. Dates, if you eat them, you won't get a sugar spike in your blood, even though you've taken because they're, they're, they're massive. They sit in the stomach, and they take a while to peel off the sugar that's in them. But if you take that much sugar and put it in, you'll get a huge spike, and the body has to compensate with an insulin blast to take it out. Because of why? Because there's a lot more surface area on these powders for the metabolic processes to work. And so this is one thing about refined foods of all type, and among them, white flour, whole wheat flour and burgle and, and uh, bulgur wheat it's an, and, and gra- whole grains it's, are, m- cause much less of a metabolic challenge to the body, all of these, these whole foods, because of the refinement factor and what we've just mentioned about the surface area upon which the metabolic processes have to work. Uh, vegetable oils. These are one of the big things that are th- people, 
you know, there's a grand hurrah for corn oil and for soybean oil. And for, you know, our ancestors didn't eat these things. They clarified butter ghee. They ate all, all these other things. If you want to read a more full discussion, we don't have time for discussing it anymore. We're just about time's up. But uh, read Sally Fallon's Nourishing Traditions about the value of traditional fats over the food guru vegetable fats that they're to- zero cholesterol, corn oil, and all of this business. The one that, d- that does have a clean bill of health is olive oil. This is something that was used, and this is something that is the monosaturated oil. It's very different. Uh, margarine, solid vegetable stuff. Everybody knows this already, but I'll tell you again just for practice. Solid vegetable uh, fa- fat uh, that's in a solid form at room temperature is just like poison. It's just like stuffing your arteries with plugs. It turns out to be very bad for one indeed. Uh, trans fats, so margarine shortening. And then things like uh, egg replacements. We get into the American grocery at this point. Uh, meat extenders, uh, fake broths, and ersatz cream. Ersatz is an adjective that was, came from World War II when the Germans were using sawdust to produce coffee with because they didn't have any real foods. So they were, ersatz means faked up, basically. Processed cheese, factory, uh, factory uh, farmed meats, protein powders, and packets of stuff that never spoils. Atif Khan to conclude my discussion, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, inshallah ta'ala. If you have a question, if I know the answer, I'll be glad to answer it any other time, but we're finished, basically. He told me about a website that he had seen uh, that somebody had uh, bought a Big Mac, and he had uh, forgot all about it somehow, and stuck it in his suit pocket. And so he found it uh, two months later, and it was unchanged. And so he began a Big Mac collection and photogra- you know, photographed after 18 months. After, you know. And so things that don't go bad, the, the microbes are scared of them. You know. So what do we want with them? And so this is a, a vignette. That's a lot of tawfiq with Taisir. So in general, you know, what man has done, man can do. And our ancestors, they ate simpler fare and more plain fare, and they exercised more, and they were a bit thinner. And all of these things have a factor, and they were more religious. And so all of these things make for the uh, ex- extremely long periods that they lived and so were, had happy and longer and uh, more peaceful lives than many of us have today. And they didn't have a lot of weird degenerative diseases. Uh, anyway, uh, I recommend the, uh, the books that I've mentioned, The China Report and Nourishing Traditions, Happy, uh, Healthy at 100, and the books of Andrew Whale and uh, some of these other ones that I've mentioned. This is the short list. Get them and read them if you can, if you know somebody that has to borrow it and see what it's about. And that's a lot, Tawfiq. No. Yeah, you look at the, yeah, the, the, that tells you something about yourself and about your own genetic uh, disposition. Is it a heat-causing thing? And so, for example, the Chinese said, well, don't eat uh, a lot of oysters in the summertime because they're a hot food and they, they cause heat. A person does have to look at that and see a law has made some fruits in the winter and has made some fruits in the summer, and they do have a lot to do with the people that live in the areas where those fruits are produced. And then it's a lot of equities here. So that's about it, inshallah ta'ala. And if for, forgot everything, anything, inshallah ta'ala, we can. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, w- one of the most important things, if we, can get a, if we could get a lending library or somebody that could bring it on a regular basis, the uh, uh, Nutrition Action uh, Newsletter. Unfortunately, they're subject to many of the fallacies that I've mentioned, but they do have some good articles about salt and about this and about that, about major food concerns. Uh, Nutrition Action Health Letter. And secondly, uh, consumer reports on health, mostly geared towards the medical establishment uh, type remedies, but it also contains some valuable analysis. These two publications, they're only about six pages a month or so, and they're well worth reading, and uh, the, especially the feature articles are extremely good. They don't have any advertising. They're not pushing anybody's agenda, and they have double-blind uh, experiments, which are, as we said, abstract, but they're the best sort of science that is done in the present. Allah, Taufiq, what I say. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.